Good morning, everyone. This is Professor Keen. I am doing my very first online lecture. I'm doing this from home. Uh, I am not used to talking to a computer screen. I much enjoy uh, talking to you in person, but I guess this is what we have for now. Uh, and so um, if I pause now and then to gather my thoughts, it's because I'm really not used to talking to a computer. Uh, so please bear with me. So uh, up until this point in the semester, we have been talking about Galileo, Galileo's dialogues concerning two new sciences. Just to jog your memory, uh, the two new sciences that Galileo was interested in were primarily the strength of materials and also projectile motion. He wrote his dialogues in 1638. Uh, we are putting behind us Galileo now. For the rest of the semester, what we'll be doing is, first of all, talking about the work of Blaise Pascal, his physical treatises. And then we'll work through some of Newton's Principia and finally end with Einstein's relativity. Uh, so today what I want to do is give you a short introduction to the work of Blaise Pascal. Uh, Blaise Pascal was a contemporary of Galileo's. Remember, Galileo wrote his dialogues. His final work was in 1638. Uh, Pascal was born in 1623 in Clermont, a town in France, and he died in 1662. Uh, he wrote uh, on a wide variety of topics. Uh, this is, by the way, the reference here is A Student's Guide to the Great Physics Text, Chapter 13, on Reason, Authority, and Science. And I'm looking at the introductory section. Uh, that's what's being shown here on my using Snagit to grab this picture on the computer. You'll see here, this is chapter 13, Reason, Authority, and Science. Uh, so looking at the introduction, Pascal was born in Claremont. Uh, he published a lot of different works. He published works on arithmetic and geometry and probability theory. He also is claimed by many computer scientists to be one of the first computer scientists. He designed a, an arithmetic adding machine to do calculations. His father was actually um, apparently a tax collector. And so this was meant to uh, simplify these taxing calculations, I suppose. Pascal uh, not only wrote on mathematics and probability uh, and did some elementary computational work, but he also wrote a lot about theology. Uh, he, one of his most famous works is the Pensees. Uh, I have not read those in their entirety. I've read portions of them. You might have come across them in a theology course you took, but it was basically a defense, uh, an apology, apologetics, or defense of the Christian faith against some of the critics that were um, being, I suppose, very critical of Christianity around this time. Um, he also uh, wrote some letters called the Provincial Letters. He did these um, through a pseudonym so that they were pretty controversial because they were very um, they were very critical of the Jesuits. Pascal himself was a Jansenist, which is a, a branch of Christianity that had a slightly different view of salvation than, I guess, some of the traditional Roman Catholic views on salvation. And so he was very critical of the, of the Jesuits. And he wrote these um, provincial letters, which I've read those, and those are actually very, very funny. So they're hilarious, very satirical. Uh, and you can see why he might have written them, written them with a pseudonym, because uh, they were very, uh, I guess, pointed in their criticism. What we'll be going into in this course is not his theological writings or his mathematical writings, but his physical writings, specifically his treatise on the vacuum. Uh, so today we're going to jump into the preface to the treatise on the vacuum. Uh, that begins here on page 172. But before we start talking about this, let's jump ahead and look at... Um, let me see if I can do this. I'm going to skip down a couple of pages. Uh, let me see if I click here and jump to the end of the chapter, the study questions. Um, the first study question is, which is more trustworthy, the testimony of authorities or the testimony of reason? I always find it to be helpful to look through the study questions before we start reading through the text to get a sense of what we'll be talking about. So Pascal is interested in the question of what is our source of knowledge? Is the most important source of knowledge the testimony of others who we see as authorities or is the testimony of reason, which he would equate with sort of the scientific method? And then according to Pascal, in what field of inquiry should one rely upon the testimony of each of these? And in what, what's the consequence of using the testimony of authority or reason in the wrong context? So let's jump back to page 172 and look at how he addresses these sorts of questions. So if you look at the top here, uh, he gives a, a summary of what he's going to be saying. He says, we have carried our respect for antiquity so far today in matters in which it should have less influence that we treat all its ideas as revelation, revelations and even its obscurities as mysteries. We can no longer advance new opinions without danger. And an author's text is enough to destroy the strongest arguments. So he's here criticizing an over um, an over reverence for the testimony of ancient writers. He goes on to say that this is not my intention to correct one vice by another and to have no esteem for the ancients because they are too much esteemed. I do not want to banish their authority to set up reason alone although there's an attempt to establish their authority alone to the prejudice of reason. So in other words, he's not trying to say that the testimony of ancient authorities is useless. Um, on the other hand, he's saying that uh, it needs to be put into perspective. And so the question is, at what 
For what kinds of domains of knowledge is the testimony of ancient authorities more trustworthy, and in what area of knowledge is the testimony of reason and experiment more important? And so if you want to look down here, I'm uh, moving my cursor around, um, he mentions here that to make this important distinction with care, we must consider that one group depends exclusively on memory and purely historical, having as their only object to know what authors have written, and the other group depends exclusively on reason and are wholly dogmatic, having as their object to seek and discover hidden truths. So what is he saying here? He's saying that when you want to know about history, if you want to know what happened in the past, you must necessarily rely on the accounts of ancient people. After all, you weren't there. Uh, in fact, the, one of the, I guess, the, the primary assumption that's made in the study of history is that, is that at least in some cases, the testimony of human beings is reliable. After all, if you can't trust anything people have written, then you really can't study history. So that's sort of a precondition for the study of history. You have to rely on the documents of ancients. Uh, so what about um, in the domain of reason? He says that in reason, he says, is wholly dogmatic having their object to seek and discover hidden truths. And we'll explore what he means by that in a moment. So what are some of the areas of knowledge that one needs to use the testimony of authorities? If you go down here to the fourth full paragraph, he says, in matters which we seek to know only what authors have written, as in history, geography, jurisprudence, you might know that's the study of law, languages, and above all in theology, and in short, wherever either the simple fact or an institution, human or divine, is a starting point, we must necessarily have recourse to books, since all that can be known about such matters is contained there. So, for example, if you jump down another paragraph, he says, if it is a question of knowing who was the first king of France, where the geographers put the first meridian, what words are used in a dead language, and everything of this sort, how could we find it out except from books? And then he goes on to say that in theology, authority has its chief weight because there is in, there it is inseparable from truth, which we know only through it, so that to give absolute certainty to things which reason can least grasp, it is sufficient to point them out in holy scriptures. So, for example, if you want to know things about history, whether they are secular history, I suppose, who was the king of France, um, you can't go into the laboratory and test who the king of France was in the 1700s. You have to rely on the testimony of people who were there, who saw the coronation ceremony, who then wrote and said, I know that this was the king of France, and that will tell you the answer to that question. Uh, this is the same kind of thing with Holy Scripture. Um, if you want to know what happened to the people of Israel, you can't go into the laboratory and reenact the Exodus, for example. You have to rely on the testimony of the people who were there. So you really don't have any other choice in studying history and if in studying theology. You must rely on the testimony of ancients. Now, what about what kind of domain is the authority of reason most important? If you jump down to the bottom, he says it is quite otherwise with subjects accessible to sense or reasoning. Here, authority is useless. Only reason can know them. Authority and reason have their separate rights. A moment ago, one had all the advantage. Here, the other is queen in her turn. So I'm going to jump to the next page. So what are the kinds of areas of study where the testimony of reason are most important? So Pascal lists a few of them right here. He says, thus, it is that geometry, arithmetic, music, physics, medicine, architecture, and all the science all the sciences subject to experiment and reason must be added to if they are to become perfect. The ancients found them merely sketched by their predecessors, and we shall leave them to our successors in a more perfected state than we receive them. Since their perfection depends upon time and effort, it is evident that even if our effort and time had gained us less than the labors of the ancients, separated from ours, the two together nevertheless must have more effect than either one alone. So if you want to know something about Mathematics, if you want to know what the sum of the internal angles of a triangle are, you can use ma use reason, mathematical proof, to determine what the sum of the internal angles of a triangle are. If you want to know how much uh, how much something weighs, you're, you must use reason. And here Aunt Pascal is using the term reason synonymously with experiment. And so you have to go into the laboratory and weigh how much you weigh if you want to know how much you weigh. Uh, it's you, you, I suppose you could read a historical document about the weight, the, the weight that you had 10 years ago, for example, but if you want to know how much you weigh now, you have to go into the laboratory and weigh yourself. All right. Now, let's look at the next question. Here, I want to jump to question 13.2. Is there an essential difference between animals and men? And do you agree with Pascal on this question? So, if you look ahead here to page 174, he talks about the distinction between people and men. So I'm just going to read this paragraph right here, starting with however. 
However, it is a strange thing how we reverence their opinions. He's talking about the ancients. To contradict them counts as a crime, and to add them add to them is an outrage. So he's kind of criticizing how science is being stifled by too much respect for the opinions of the ancients. To contradict them counts as a crime, and to add to them is an outrage, as if they had left no more truths to know. Is not this to treat man's reason with indignity and to put it on a level with animal instinct, since we thereby take away the main difference? And here we go. This is the difference between animals and men. Since we thereby take away the main difference, which consists in this, that the effects of reason increase continually, whereas instinct always remains in the same state, beehives were as well laid out a thousand years ago as today, and each bee forms that hexagon as exactly the first time as the last. It is the same with everything animals make by that hidden motion. Nature teaches them in response to the pressure of necessity, but this frail knowledge dies with its need. As they receive it without study, they do not have the happiness of preserving it. And every time they, the animals, are given it, they find it new, because nature, whose object is merely to maintain animals in an order of limited perfection, infuses in them this necessary knowledge, always the same, lest they perish, and does not allow them to add to it, lest they go beyond the boundaries prescribed to them. So that's how animals behave, by instinct. And now he goes on to talk about how men, people, are different. He says, it is different with man, made only for infinity. He is ignorant in his life's first age, but he never ceases to learn as he goes forward. For he has the advantage not only of his own experience, but also of his predecessor's experience. Because he always keeps in his memory the knowledge he has once acquired, and that of the ancients is always at hand in the books they have left. And since he keeps his knowledge, he can also easily increase it, so that men today are in a certain sense in the same condition which those ancient philosophers would be if they could have prolonged their old age until now, adding to the knowledge they had what their studies might have won for them by the grace of so many centuries. Hence, it is that by a special prerogative, not only does each man advance from day to day in the sciences, but all men together make a continual progress as the universe grows old, because the same thing happens in the succession of men as in the different ages of an individual man, so that the whole series of men during the course of so many centuries should be considered as one self-same man, always in existence and continually learning, whence it is seen with what injustice we respect antiquity in the persons of its philosophers. For since old age is the age furthest removed from childhood, who does not see that the old age of this universal man should be sought not in the times near his birth, but in those which are most distant from it? Those whom we call ancients were in truth new in every respect, and actually formed the childhood of man, and since we have added to their knowledge the experience of the succeeding centuries, it is in ourselves that the antiquity can be found which we revere in others. So here we are talking about the difference between the cumulative knowledge of human beings and the fact that animals do not have this kind of cumulative knowledge. So we can basically use books to learn what our ancestors thought about this and that, whereas animals don't write books, so they don't know what their grandparents went through. They act by instinct. And so this is really a, a defense from Pascal's perspective of the progressive nature in, of knowledge. And really the point he's trying to make here is that we shouldn't esteem the opinions of the ancient philosophers too highly when they speak about things that they didn't have the advantage of many, many years of study in talking about. And this is what he goes on to talk about in the next page. He says that the ancients should be admired, I'm reading from the top of page 175, the ancients should be admired for the consequences they drew correctly from the little stock of principles they had, and they should be excused for those in which they lacked the advantage of experiment rather than the force of reason. For were they not excusable for their opinion about the Milky Way galaxy, when the weakness of their eyes as yet unaided by artifice, that is by kind of technology, they attributed its color to a greater density in that part of the sky which would more powerfully reflect the light? But would we not be inexcusable for holding to the same opinion now that with the help of the telescope, we have discovered an infinity of little stars there whose more abundant light has made us recognize the true cause of their, that whiteness. So Pascal here is referring specifically to the recent observations of Galileo, uh, where Galileo pointed his telescope at the Milky Way galaxy and found that it was not just a white splash across the sky, but was comprised of many, many uh, very tiny stars. And so just because the ancients be believed that it was a, a nebulous cloud, uh, doesn't mean that we should take their opinions more seriously than the opinions, say, of Galileo, who was aided by a telescope who could vis um, visualize these individual stars that the ancients could not. And so what Pascal is basically doing here is he's trying to create room for scientific discovery. And saying, if you jump to the end here, he's saying that we can say things that are contradictory to the thoughts of the ancients without really violating their spirit of discovery. So we don't have to say, you know, Aristotle was a complete idiot. Um, we can just say he didn't know some of the things that we know now. Um, he thought things that were 
uh, brilliant for his time and brilliant even for any time, but he lacked some of the experimental observations that we have now. And so he's kind of making space for the, for the discovery of new knowledge. Um, one thing I guess I'd like to end with here is the, this Pascal is presenting kind of this progressive view of knowledge, but I'd like to push back a little bit against this and ask, uh, is our knowledge of everything increasing all the time? Uh, he seems to have this progressive view where we just keep getting smarter and smarter and better and better as we gain more and more knowledge. But I guess the question I would like to raise is, are we losing some knowledge? And in particular, if you think back to the testimony of the ancients and the authorities um, about history, are there historical events that have been lost when libraries have been burned or that people simply do not study anymore, or perhaps that they read, but they don't take as seriously as people did in the past, um, that really are giving us an atrophied view of history or nature. So in particular, if there were true things, however amazing they might be to us now, that have actually occurred in history that we no longer take seriously or recall, then I would argue that we perhaps have lost something critical. Uh, so um, maybe that's something to think about as you're um, thinking about the work of Pascal. Okay, that's a short introduction to Pascal. Uh, I'd like to end there. And when I, in my next lecture, I'll be talking about specifically chapter 14, on Pascal's principle, and I will speak to you again soon.